Alright guys, welcome back. Today, we're taking a look at one of my pawn shop finds that I found in Houston where I was out of town on vacation for Christmas. This is a Ruger P89. Now, these were real hot in the late 80s, early 90s. And you know what, let me turn down the brightness on this light here. Oh, wrong one. There we go. Um, these were real hot in the 80s and early 90s. And Ruger produced these up until, uh, well, the, produced the P series up until about 2013. So basically, let's go over a little bit on the history on these. So in the 80s, the US government was looking to replace the legendary and reliable 1911. Well, Ruger wanted in on some of that military contract action, so they designed the Ruger P-85, the predecessors to this handgun. Well, it did relatively well in the trials. However, the, unfortunately for Ruger, and uh, fortunately for the U.S. government, uh, the contract ended up going to Beretta in their M9 series of handguns. Uh, and in my opinion, the Beretta M9 is a better handgun than the Ruger P89 but you know that was that was the the way that it worked so after that contract uh, after those trials ended and Ruger lost they decided to go ahead and produce this uh, handgun for the civilian market anyways and it did end up going to some um, military and police forces around the world as well um, these got used uh, in the Middle East by police uh, forces and stuff like that and uh, there's probably some that got used in the militaries as well and it is a relatively robust and uh, sturdy handgun it is relatively accurate as well so in uh, uh, when they started producing the P85 the P85 uh, differed from this it had a, uh, a milled steel receiver uh, versus this one here and that was the original gun. Now, a lot of people, if you're an anime person, you know the P85 was one of the guns that Spike used in Cowboy Bebop. And that was partly because at the time that this gun came out, it was really cutting edge and futuristic. Had a lot of interesting features that weren't really common yet in the 80s. Um, so, you know, that was one of the things with it. Now, they did two, do two versions of the P85. They had the original version, the Mark I. Uh, but they did end up doing a Mark II because they had discovered that in the Mark I, the decocker, uh, I am going to show that it is clear, the decocker on these, when you decocked, could technically have enough force on the firing pin to accidentally cause a discharge. So with the Mark II of the P85, they corrected that issue with the decocker and all was right with the world once again well ruger being uh ruger and uh having lots of experience with casting especially with their ruger mini series you know the mini 14 and the uh, mini 30s um they decided to switch it up and start casting the lowers for these handguns so when they came out with the uh, p89 uh, they end up switching up to a cast alloy lower uh, lower frame on these handguns, which was considerably lighter than the uh, you know milled steel receiver that the 85 had. Now that said, it is still a relatively heavy handgun, so it does mitigate recoil pretty good. Uh, I, but I imagine the 85 was even better because it was even heavier. Now personally, I love steel frame uh, guns. Uh, it's one of my passions, you know, that I like the weight of them. I like how it uh, mitigates recoil, all that. Um, but, you know, I do like these alloyed frames guns as well. Now, if you look up close, you can really tell it that it is cast because it's very um, rough. It's almost like velvet. Now, I believe that the slides may be cast as well. Because if you look there, that's still pretty rough in there. Uh, but they may be cast as well. 
So this particular model is known as the KP89, and that's because it is a stainless steel slide and uh, slide in uh, with them, and that K just stood for the uh, the stainless steel model. Now this is a double single action uh, handgun, so you know you got a double action pull and then single action as well. Uh, and of course you rack it, you got that really nice, you know, relatively good uh, single action. Now this gun did have some uh, pretty revolutionary stuff at the time. For instance, like I said, it had a ambi decocker, which is actually fairly easy to use but it is in an odd position uh, you have to have long thumbs and a weird angle to get up to that um, it is what it is I have small hands so I actually have issues with some of the controls on this gun now the slide release on this is also a little strange as it is smooth no this is not worn out that's how it is on the factory and it you they got these serrations up top so you just kind of reach up there so it's a little strange now it also has an ambi mag release now the mag release is a little strange because unlike most handguns that we see today where it's a button uh, you have to actually push these forward to get the mag to release and as you see it does drop free with the magazine um, and I believe what are these these 13, 12, I'll put it on the screen what capacity these magazines are, um, but you know, uh, they're out there. Now, because I have small hands, I can't reach the four, uh, the, the left hand one, um, left side extractor, uh, eject, uh, mag release like I normally would, and then also the index is a little strange, but I am able to get it relatively easy with my middle finger when I'm dropping it. So that is one thing on it. So let's kind of go over the the uh, how the trigger is before we get into the gun itself. So on the double action, once again, we are indeed clear, and it does have last round hold open. So on the double, we do have a little bit of slack there hit that wall pretty long pretty heavy done fantastic there and then boom so it does kind of just have a long travel and it just breaks there's not really a wall that you feel or anything like that now for the single action let me go over here we have just a little bit of take up and then you hit the wall there's not really any stacking and it's just a clean break actually a relatively nice single action trigger on this thing I mean you got that slack there now let's check the reset quite a, quite a long ways on the reset uh, there it is and then back so that's a little odd there that normally when you do the reset right there at that break with the reset that's the wall right there to shoot again but as you saw there's a little bit of take back up to go in there so it wouldn't be too hard to to train to accurately shoot this gun not the best trigger in the world but by far not the worst either so anyways let's get into <coughs> this assembly of this <coughs> gun so you have to have the mag out on these, and I, if I remember correctly, you have to have the safety on as well. So you see, you got to just simply catch here. I think I got to simply catch. It's been a while since I've taken, taken this thing apart. Ah, one second. Okay, so I remember what it was now. It's it's a little weird, so. If you look right here, there's a little ejection claw that's right here inside of the gun. Now, most handguns will disassemble simply by taking out the catch and sliding the four forward. But on the P89, you have to push that ejector down so it's not 
in the way of the slide. So once you do that, uh, once you do that and it's down, you can you can bring it back, press out the line up that notch right there. Press out and pull out. Now it is a captive pin, uh, uh, disassembly pin on the P89. Unlike the, um, like most handguns, so you don't have to actually, you know, take that out. It is captive, so don't try to take it out. And it slides forward. Now, if you look, it has relatively little locking or a slide surface that the slide rides on. And now we got a better view of that ejector. So you do got to keep it down and out of the way while the gun is disassembled. And you have to keep it down when you reassemble. Now if you look here, what we have basically is a SIG, SIG style locking system with a 1911 um, link, link system here. So we got a recoil spring that is on a one piece guide rod. And a guide rod is really light. I don't know. That might be aluminum. Um, the bolt comes forward and slides out the back. So, you know, real simple, you know, set up kind of a hybrid system between the SIG and, you know, the, the 1911. But not a whole lot going on here. You can see more of those, uh, that rough cast surface inside of there. And they only machine where they need to machine, which is a good thing because, you know, that keeps cost down. I'll put the barrel back in. Make sure that link is up. Drop that back in place. All right there. All right, and we put her back together like so. Make sure that little notch is lined up, and just like so. And now we got to make sure that ejector is back up again, and then we're ready to go. Now. In my opinion, that ejector is probably one of the biggest flaws in this gun, simply because, well, that's an extra step you have to do to field strip this gun. That said, it's not that big of an issue to me, simply because you know it's uh, it is what it is. This was a it's an old gun, but it is a futuristic gun for its time. Now this particular model, I did look at the Ruger website, uh, website and look up the seal number. It is a 1999 production model. So this gun was made and shipped in 1999. Now these grips are actually really nice in that retro 80s look on them. And you can get replacement grips for this. Now when shooting this gun, it does have basic, you know, you know, three dot sights on it, which aren't horrible, but they're not the best. They are dovetailed, so you can replace these out if you want, if you're able to find them. This gun's been around a while, there's a lot of them out there, so you might be able to still find some despite it being discontinued. Now, I do need to float this rear sight a little bit because this gun does seem to shoot to the left by about uh, four to six inches at about, I don't know, 10 yards, which is pretty bad. Um, but if you look, the sights seem to be centered. So I'm not sure if it has something to do with the barrel or whatnot, what's going on. The barrel seems to be in good shape. So it could just be that this particular gun has a tendency to shoot to the left. Now, I got this particular one in a pawn shop for sub $300. I think I spent uh, 230 on it, give or take. Um, so, you know, I got a pretty good deal on it. These do tend to be collectible. People do like them. They are good guns. They are super reliable, super strong, and you can't really kill them. They, a lot of people refer to them as tanks, um, uh, especially in the Ruger uh, community. Uh, people really love these, and one way I can describe this is when I found this gun, I made a post in a Ruger group that I'm in um, that was a pawn shop find. Well, this, the post I made with just a couple pictures of this gun is still getting likes, you know, like three, four weeks later. So, you know, the Ruger people really love these things. Um, and uh, to be honest, 
I was actually, after my first time shooting it, I was thinking about selling it. Um, I don't like the recoil impulse on it all that much. The grips are pretty fat. You don't really need to be anywhere near that fat, to be honest. I have small hands, so really fat grips like this, you know, don't make good for me. However, I might look and see what kind of grips are out there, if there's anything thinner that's, that's out there that might fit my hands a little bit better. But, when I went out and shot it today, I kind of feel a little different about it. And I didn't put that many rounds, I put maybe three or four round, uh, mags through it today. And I just feel just a little better about the gun today than I did that first time shooting it. I don't know exactly what changed. I don't think anything actually changed. I could have been in a better, better mood today. I don't know. But it it's growing on me. And I'm thinking I might keep it in my collection. The only way I would trade this gun uh, at this point maybe. Um, I might test the water. See what's out there. Um, but it would be if I could get a surplus Beretta 92. Um, like an M, M, uh, Beretta M9, you know, a certain military surplus Beretta M9, or if I could get an actual original, uh, P85, either, a, you know, either Gen 1 or 2. That would be maybe where I'm at for, as far as trades, um, for this thing. Um, it is what it is, but so far, uh, it's been pretty good. I like it. I, di I dig it, you know, it's, got, it's real retro. It's, um... You know, it's got more pros than cons to me, uh, but the cons that it does have are more or less just uh, a product of the time that this gun was, was designed. You know, they were trying to be cutting edge with it, which they were. Um, you know, everything ambi, that wasn't something that was really around in the 80s or, or prior to that. But the way it was implemented, well, it wasn't quite up to, to snuff to today. For instance, I would have loved for these, uh, the Ambi mag release to have simply been a push button on each side. That would have been far easier to work. Um, it's easier to just go, you know, smash to, to drop than it is to press forward. You have to use a little bit more precision to do that. The other thing I would have liked to see is the mag release. One, I would have liked to have had some kind of catch or something on it to where you can push down on it and then bring it back a little bit longer to where someone with smaller hands could you know get that down now also the frame could be thinner you know but I'm just nitpicking on it the um, these guns are great you know a lot of people love them this one shoots relatively good despite it shooting to the left I'm gonna try to correct that and uh, see what it does with it and it's probably gonna just end up staying in the safe and in the collection and then eventually ending up on the gun wall but anyways that's it today for the ruger p89 if y'all guys can do me a favor could y'all give me a like and subscribe um we are growing very fast so far i'm my plan is i know all last year i was saying i want to get to a thousand subs in 2022 didn't happen but the last couple months of 2022 i did figure out something that kind of helped me grow really fast and I gained like two or three, uh, 200, almost 300 subscribers in just the course of a couple months. And I'll tell you what, in 90 days, the last 90 days uh, of uh, 2022, I got over 100K views, which is far more than I had in the past six years <laughs> or so. So if y'all guys give me a like, subscribe, that'd be great. I want to try to get monetized. I don't want to be beholden to the uh, to the YouTube lords, but it is expensive making this gun content. Ammo is expensive, and I can't shoot if I'm broke all the time. So if y'all help me out, I want to get up there. I want to be able to make good content for you guys. I want to be able to get my hands on cool guns and uh, stuff that really you don't see too often. But anyways, y'all guys have a good one, and I'll uh, see y'all next time.